A note to the listeners, episode 86 contains very brief, explicit language. Word nerd. Wordsmith. Wordy. Wordless. Oxford Dictionary says a word is a single, distinct, meaningful element of speech or writing, used with others or sometimes alone. We say each one matters. No extra words is literature, minimalist style. And we're getting you right to the story. Wedding day. Groom brings plus one. That Boy's a Catch by Tina Taco. Your daddy and I just figured all this nonsense would be over by now. My mother has just dropped six spoonfuls of instant coffee into a mug filled with hot water from the bathroom sink. Her spoon chinks and chinks and chinks and chinks the side with the chip. I sip the tea I brought from Berkeley. You're 31, Tanya Grace. I hope someone's told you what that means. My father has read what he can of the newspaper. He has shaved off the end of his pencil and is circling the houses locked in foreclosure. He and Uncle Rex can be in and out in under an hour, the knobs and faucets silent in the sacks my mother sews. Four sweatshirts wide, she used to tutor, so the stuff don't clang so much like. I sip the tea I brought from Berkeley. My advisor told me about the place, extolling the flakiness of their scones. After walking past it for two more semesters, I finally got up the nerve to go in and order one. When the high school girl behind the counter asked which kind, I had to say, surprise me. My mother's housecoat catches the nick in the butcher block as she tips her weight against the counter. He's not going to wait around forever, you know. The last chunk of the butter cake I picked up in St. Louis is still in its box, propped on the little burner at the back of the range, which my father has been meaning to look at. My mother sets the box on my father's newspaper, but he waves his pencil at it, the hunch of his shoulders inert. His pencil shavings blow into the used autos column. My mother settles the box on one of the front burners and eats. You know what happened to that Morton girl? That Morton girl, there are five, is Jane. After two years at Mike's Tackle... She bought a duffel bag and begged one of her cousins to drive her to Middle Tennessee State. Sociology and anthropology and waitressing. Seven years. She moved to New York the year I started my thesis. When she came home the following Christmas, John Harling paid her back rent. His marriage to her lasted less time than her time in Greenwich Village. No use keeping it in if nothing's coming out, my mother says, her nose in her mug. The phone rings. It's probably Mrs. Morton. My mother makes for the living room. My little cousins like to call it the alligator phone. They do not yet know the word avocado. They like to twirl the cord around silverware they have pilfered from the kitchen, pretending it is green spaghetti. I pull Applied Mathematics for Physics, a new approach, from the chair alongside me. It sticks against the cherry vinyl, making that sound my cousins think is hilarious. My father smiles, circling another foreclosure. He turns a page. I turn a page. He pulls another pencil and his knife from one of his breast pockets. He gives the pencil four easy strokes, then blunts the new point between his fingernails. That point will never break. He hands the pencil to me without a glance. I take it, even though I have started in yellow highlighter. I underline words that will never be spoken inside the county line. The door swings in, and my mother is back. She is about to shoot off a tale about someone or something, but stops a few words in. Books off the table, miss. I oblige, returning it to the chair. There is still plenty of time to finish my syllabus before the start of the semester. As my mother would say, there is never any reason to court an argument. You need to think about what you want, Tanya Grace. He's always been on a path, that one. It's not easy getting county work nowadays, and he's got seniority. The last wedge of butter cake in her throat, my mother says, medical benefits for life. She goes back to the bathroom for some more hot water, and I pull out my phone, pointing it at the four walls for a signal. I am uncertain if it is the aerial on the roof or the hill's minerals that deter the natural flow of anything in or out. I am finally reading, Grace, when you get here on Monday, can we review when my mother's slipper cracks a curl in the linoleum? 
Oh, for the sake of the Lord, girl. I return my phone to the patchwork knapsack I have carried since grad school, the one that reminds me of Mima's quilt work. It will blend in at Cal State, even though it never blends with my Fendi pumps. I sip the last of the tea I brought from Berkeley. I bring the mug to the sink. I am explaining under the cold spray that I do not want to hit traffic in Kansas City. My mother says that's wise of me. My knapsack is not even on my shoulder as I swing the door toward the living room. My mother follows me, and my father follows her. I sidle around a few of his boxes, heavy with his latest round of acquisitions, and I admire the way he has taped them. Those seams will never break. At the screen door, my mother has my face in her palms. She is telling me to drive safe and other things. The alligator phone starts up again. She kisses me hard on one cheek and makes for the receiver. She tells whoever it is to hang on and, without covering the mouthpiece, says, Now get your head in line, Tanya Grace. That boy's a catch. My mother fades and my father steps into her place. He dips into his other breast pocket pulls out a small rectangle of bills, probably fives and singles. He nestles it into my hands, cups them at the knuckles. I smile, push the little pack into my pocket next to the pencil. As I maneuver down the driveway, then floor it onto the county road, I remember that Applied Mathematics for Physics, a new approach, is seated on the cherry vinyl. I do not go back. My mother will send it with one of her little notes. This was at my own expense, Tanya Grace to the address she has for me in Berkeley. But the book will never reach me. My boxes are already headed south to Cal State, to an address I have neglected to leave behind, and I am well beyond anything sent from home. Hello there! Welcome to No Extra Words, the Flash Fiction Podcast. My name is Chris Baker Dersh. I'm your producer and editor. We started today with a six word short story, which is not a No Extra Words first. I did one all the way back on episode, I want to say six. I'd have to look it up, but I think it's episode six. I'll link it in the show notes. Our microfiction triumvirate when I did one of my own six word short stories. But this is the first time I have a six word short story by a contributor. Contributor to this one is Jim Zabo. If you haven't heard my conversation with Jim Zabo, it is special number 14 feature the podcaster. Jim is the host of secondhand stories, which is a podcast of slightly longer short stories. And Jim and I had a great chat. And he emphasized in that conversation that while he would like to write, it is not something he's currently making time for. So I was pleasantly surprised to see a submission from Jim and to have it be a six word story is just delightful. The six word story format is not new. It is rumored to go back to Hemingway, although most people think that story is apocryphal. The rumor is that somebody once asked Hemingway if he could write a short story in six words, and he came back with for sale baby shoes never worn. And there's no evidence that's been found that that actually happened or that he actually wrote that story. But that's kind of where the legend of the six word short story comes from. And they're still around. You can find them. My actually favorite place to look for six word stories and six word story prompts. There's a Twitter account that I'll link in the show notes. I think the handle is Agatha Chocolates. I'll look for it in the show notes. But she regularly posts a random photo and then asks you to use it to write a short story in six words or less. And that's fun to kind of keep an eye on that on Twitter. There, I think there's actually a six word stories.com that takes submissions of these. And probably the best known, I believe it was Smith Magazine, did for a number of years a six word memoir writing contest. And there are several books published that compiled those from, I think their tagline was from writers both famous and obscure. And the title of at least the first one in those series is not quite what I was planning. Um, that's definitely worth checking out. I used to read those a lot with my teenagers when I was a school librarian and encourage them to write their six word memoirs. I don't know what is magical about six. It does kind of feel like it's the minimum that you could really get any kind of a coherent story out of, but there's something magical about that six word story format. You can also find them on Reddit. They're kind of all over the place. So it was the first time I'd ever received a submission for one. 
And I was excited to see it. I will warn you all that if you start sending me sex word stories, I'm going to get pretty picky pretty fast about what we do and don't air just because of the nature of the tight format. And Jim was hysterical when he sent it because it can be hard to be original in this format. And so he wrote, I don't think anyone's ever come up with this one. I don't know if I was the first, but this is definitely one that I wrote. So that was a fun, fun way to start off. Talk about microfiction in the extreme. We have been playing a lot with microfiction over the last several months since our anniversary episode when we did Drabbles. We're doing our Drabble on Instagram challenge, so keep an eye on that. We had microfiction in the last episode. We had just microfiction all over the place. So that was a fun way to start. And we went from that to Tina Taco. Tina Taco is our first five-time contributor to the show. Tina's first appearance on the show goes all the way back to episode 19, back in the fall of 2015. And Tina generally does microfiction. This is her longest piece that she sent to us by a lot. She joked me when she sent it to me that she thinks this piece might be more, might be longer than all four of her previous works on this show together. But that boy's a catch. I can't say enough about that story. It is so evocative of this moment of place and this moment of family. And the characters that come to life, the dad, and I really want to know more about Mima. I honestly want to sit and write a short story just all about Mima, who's ever so briefly mentioned in this story. So poignant, tugs at the heart story. It's hard to even know where to go from there. And the title of this episode, there's about three that I could have pulled right out of that story. But the title of this episode is Those Seams Will Never Break. And it is a great take on the ties that bind, which is really what This is about pulling you to family, pulling you away from things, pulling you towards things, pulling you but not breaking you. And so we're continuing on in this episode. Writing Spaces is back, hasn't been around for a couple of episodes, and today's Writing Spaces are all about cozy. We're going under the eaves with writers who write in small spaces, intentionally cozy spaces. Dallas Woodburn's story first appeared on episode 28, and she was voted by our listeners to be one of our rebroadcasts for our 50th episode. And she's here to tell us about her writing space, and Sheila Good is here to tell us about hers. And then we're going to move on to two more stories. It's kind of old home day here on No Extra Words. Everybody who's on the show today has been on the show at least one time before, and many of them several times. Um... Adam Kluger is back, hasn't been around for a while with Mariah, actually. And this is voiced by the legendary Bill Tush. Bill Tush started working for CNN decades before it was CNN, um, when it was part of the Turner Network out of Atlanta and was the longtime entertainment correspondent for CNN. So it's really fun to have Bill along as the voice of Adam Kluger's story. And we're really pleased to welcome Bill to the show. Mariah actually is... It's almost the odd man out in today's episode. It fits, but it doesn't. It is this character is looking for something to cling to. A lot of the other characters are intentionally making choices about what they are and are not going to cling to put up with or stay with. This character almost feels like he's looking for a reason not to make a connection in this world. And I do appreciate characters who leave me wondering in the end if they are a sympathetic character or not. And T.E. Cowell, also a regular contributor to the show, I think this is his fourth story with us, won't be his last. And his character also straddles that line between sympathetic or not sympathetic, but in a very real way. You know, it's really fun to get into everyone's heads and think about what are the things they think that they would never say out loud because it would be impolite. And so that is how... We are going to close today. It's been a delight being with you. So stick around for all of that writing spaces plus two more stories. And I feel like I'm always full of announcements these days. All I will say is watch the website, watch the social media, definitely see all the things we're playing with over on Instagram. And I'm going to see you guys next time here on No Extra Words, the Flash Fiction Podcast. I live with my husband in a one-bedroom apartment in the Bay Area, and my writing desk is wedged into a corner of our living room. It is lit by natural light from the sliding glass door that leads onto our small balcony. 
I am seven steps away from the kitchen where I go often to brew tea and 13 steps away from the bathroom. There is something about the small contained world of my apartment that enables the large world of my imagination to expand. My writing desk is strewn with papers and notes. I considered straightening it up before I took this photo, but I decided to keep it realistic. This is what my messy, creative life looks like on an average Wednesday afternoon. Even though it seems disorganized, the stacks of paper are carefully arranged. I know exactly where everything is. This disordered chaos of my writing desk makes me feel free to explore and make mistakes and take risks on the page. I don't worry too much about perfection, at least in first drafts. One of my favorite parts of my writing space is the artwork hanging on the wall above my desk. These are beautiful paintings done by students of mine, who I meet with every week for writing lessons. Their vibrant, rich artwork reminds me to keep that joyful spark alive within myself, that magic and wonder of creating something that so many of us know well as children, but it can be easy to forget as adults. Thank you so much for taking the time to visit my writing desk. If you would like to learn more about me or just simply say hello, please feel free to visit my website at Dallas Woodburn, D-A-L-L-A-S-W-O-O-D-B-U-R-N-P-R.com. Thanks. I don't know if other writers feel like I do, but there's something to me inherently romantic about having a writer's hideaway, a place of quiet solitude that allows our stories to come alive and characters just dance and run free. I've toured the homes of famous writers, and every one of them stood a small and simple desk. Perhaps it was my imagination, but as I studied these small spaces, I swear to God, I felt the words of these extraordinary writers float through the air like dust suspended in sunlight. And I wanted my own special place, my own writer's note, my own hideaway. So I started looking. The minute I saw the writing desk, I knew exactly where it would sit in my home. Dating back to the 1900s, The simple, elegant desk with its marred mahogany surface, filled with history, its decorative compartments that sat on either corner, and the tapered legs that rested on tarnished brass claws, filled me with a sense that other writers had sat there. It now sits in a quiet alcove in the upstairs portion of my home. Daylight filters through the window, and the ambient light from an antique floor lamp completes my writing hideaway. I sit often and trace the scratches that mar its surface, and I imagine the other writers who sat before me. I wonder, what did they write? Letters to loved ones or novels? Have I read their words? I don't know, but each time I sit in that cane-woven chair, I'm inspired. I picture the pages of my manuscripts resting in the decorative compartments on either side, and I write. If you want to find out more about me and my writing, visit my website at cowpasturechronicles.com. You can also find me on Twitter at Sheila M. Good or email me at SheilaGood52 at gmail.com. Saul Smeckendorf dabbed his work shirt with a wet napkin. The grease in the chicken and broccoli was going to leave a stain. The only solution was to ask for seltzer. And even though it was his absolute favorite shirt, he just didn't feel like it. It's not easy to constantly find new ways to fail. Saul always seemed to manage to even surprise himself. 
It's not easy not to know how to do stuff that everybody else seems to know how to do. But that was Saul, all over. Schmeckendorf had been skating through life for close to five decades, and he still hadn't found a way to escape one step forward, two steps back. He was a classic underachiever, who was not surprised when his fortune cookie told him the only thing to fear is fear itself. Saul was always afraid to read his fortune cookie. He would call his misanthropic pal Manfred Gogol, a frustrated cartoonist, almost daily, and they would rant at each other about life's injustices. Dylan is way overrated. And don't kid yourself, the Yankees are too old and don't have enough pitching. Yeah, I saw Godzilla. I snuck out of work and caught the last 45 minutes of the 3 p.m. screening near me. Boring. Like Pacific Rim better. You bet Mick Elroy was tired of banging that cute Danish tennis girl. He has a chippy in every town. Why in the world would he want to get married now? He's young. Of course, de Blasio is looking like the worst mayor since Dinkins, just like W was the worst president ever. Saw Tubby Winona Judd on TV this morning singing a song about soldiers in Afghanistan. Just awful. The two old friends would rail at each other and laugh at the sheer madness of it all, stupid stuff to fill the space to ignore the real horrors that floated around the edges and through the arteries of everyday existence. Life was not easy. It required a skin like an alligator and teeth like a piranha just to cut through all the BS. On the bus trip to work that morning, there was a weird schmuck ripping his newspaper into strips. Saul didn't really know why it annoyed him so much. It just did. Lots of stuff set Schmeckendorf off daily. Silly shit, like people walking by him smoking cigarettes, loud talkers, slow walkers, fools who wore brown shoes, people who popped balloons and politicians, lawyers. They really disgusted him. Saul wondered if he was alone with his litany of pet peeves. He wondered if other people knew as little about U.S. geography and algebra as he did. He wondered how it was possible he had survived for so long without the ability to fix anything, or if he would ever eventually be disowned by the scores of acquaintances he had friended on LinkedIn and Facebook. Saul wondered if when he died, if his total lack of tangible contributions to society and to humankind would be forgiven or simply ignored by the few people who actually knew him. He wondered why he did what he did for a living, telemarketing, sales, and how many people he had actually ever really helped with the various dubious business services he was selling that he never fully understood or cared to understand. He was deeply ensconced within his rut of a life and dead-end career. He was burnt out, and not a bad guy, really, even though his ex-wife hated him and his family thought he was a total loser. Saul had a few hobbies and even fewer friends. He didn't read much or watch the news. He kept to himself and didn't like people, really. At least not so much anymore. He thought organized religion was a scam and he was suspicious of most successful people. He appreciated that New York City was an organized place to live in and he loved how easy New York City made it for him to survive and fit in without being noticed. Saul could walk the streets anonymous to millions of strangers. He could look in their eyes and study their faces. Imagine having sex with the hundreds and hundreds of beautiful women he would see. He was a living ghost. He bit the dead skin off his finger and continued to type on his computer. Something had just passed by his cubicle. Saul had never seen her on this floor before. She was petite with short brown hair and a pretty face and big blue eyes. She was in the kitchen area making coffee. Saul didn't know why, but suddenly he wanted a cup of coffee too, more than he had ever wanted anything in his life. Hello. Hi. I'm Saul. I work in sales. I've never seen you around here before. Are you the new exterminator? The woman blushed slightly and giggled. Yes, that's right. I heard that there were some giant cockroaches in the sales department wearing tweed jackets. I see I've come to the right place. 
It's actually Burberry, but that's not important right now. Fred, your name is probably Fred, isn't it? As her eyes widened and mouth slowly curled into the cutest smile Saul had ever seen, the cruel and meaningless world that Saul had previously known for what seemed like forever suddenly ceased to exist completely. Moriah, actually. Sweaty by T.E. Cowell Sarah ran every morning, except on Sunday. She figured she needed at least one day of rest, and Sunday seemed as good a day as any. John asked why she ran so much soon after they started dating, and Sarah, without much of a pause, if any, said, I feel gross and bloated all day long if I don't. She'd wake up at five on the dot, or close to it, and be out of her apartment half an hour later, where she'd run for an hour. When she returned to her apartment, she'd be sweaty from head to toe. She'd take off her running clothes, a sporty tank top, mesh shorts, and white socks, in the bathroom, and then hop in the shower. Soon after John started staying the night at her place, he woke up one morning to find Sarah gone. Figuring she was still on her run, he got out of bed with an urge to pee. The bathroom door was open a little, and after John opened it wider, he saw Sarah standing on the tiled floor with her back to him. She was just starting to take off her running clothes. John watched her peel off her tank top, as if it were a giant band-aid, then tossed the tank top into the plastic basket she put all her dirties in. He looked at Sarah's skin, marveling how sweaty it was. He could see droplets of sweat on her arms, lower back, and between her shoulder blades. Then he watched her peel off her shorts next, and once she was done with that, saw the sweat droplets on the backs of her thighs. He knocked on the bathroom door then to get Sarah's attention, and after he did, she turned around quickly, clearly startled. Morning, John said. Sorry to disturb you. Sarah stood in the bathroom stiffly now. She put her arms straight out in front of her, clasped her hands together, narrowed her shoulders, and said, I'm sweaty, in an apologetic tone that John found quite charming. I can see that, he said. He stepped towards Sarah then and touched her arm near her shoulder. Don't, she said, taking a step back. That's gross. Sorry, John said. It was strange to see the woman you were dating all sweaty. John had never, he didn't think, seen a woman so sweaty before, one he was dating her otherwise. In fact, he might not have known that women could get as sweaty as his girlfriend got after her run. Lust, John thought, after Sarah had gotten in the shower and he was emptying his bladder, is stronger than disgust. Thanks for listening to the No Extra Words podcast. For more information about today's stories and contributors, or to learn how to submit your own work, please visit us at noextrawords.wordpress.com. If you would like to support the show, please tell a few friends about us, or you can visit patreon.com slash noextrawords to pledge your financial support. See you next time.